Knowledge can be taught, but glory is never shared. These were the words of Johann Bernoulli, a mathematical genius whose brilliance was matched only by his ruthless ambition. This is the story of a man who helped create the foundations of modern calculus, mentored one of history's greatest mathematicians, and yet couldn't bear to share credit with anyone, not even his own family. The Bernoulli family was extraordinary, a rare lineage that produced eight leading scientists across three generations. But their story begins not in the halls of academia, but in escape and exile. The Bernoullis were Protestant refugees who fled Antwerp for Basel, Switzerland in the 16th century. They built their fortune as merchants, and with that fortune came a strict family code. Security comes only from wealth. Business, theology, or medicine, these were the only acceptable career paths. Mathematics, strictly forbidden. But Father Nicklaus's rigid expectations would backfire spectacularly, setting the stage for a family rebellion that would change the course of mathematical history. While Jacob, the elder brother, was the first to openly defy the family for mathematics, Johann's path was more hidden, more calculated. At 15, Johann was sent to be a business apprentice, but the numbers that fascinated him weren't those of commerce, they were the numbers of the universe itself. He later enrolled at the University of Basel, officially to study medicine. But medicine was just a cover, a facade to satisfy his father. His true passion? Mathematics. And he pursued it in secret, learning everything he could from his rebellious older brother, Jacob. In 1690, Jacob Bernoulli issued a mathematical challenge that would echo through history, the catenary problem. The question was deceptively simple. What is the exact mathematical curve formed by a heavy, flexible chain hanging between two points under its own gravity? It's a shape we see every day, in suspension bridges, in power lines, in any hanging cable. But describing it mathematically, that was another matter entirely. Even Galileo had gotten it wrong, guessing the curve was a parabola. It wasn't. And here's where Johann made his first move for glory. He claimed to have solved it in a single night using the new mathematics of calculus. Let me show you how he did it. Johann analyzed an infinitesimal segment of the chain in equilibrium. Picture a tiny piece of chain hanging there, perfectly balanced. Three forces act on a segment from the lowest point to any point with coordinates x, y. First, t sub zero, the horizontal tension at the vertex, the lowest point of the chain. Second, t, the tangential tension at our point x, y. Third, w, the weight of the chain segment. This equals w times s, where w is the weight per unit length, and s is the arc length. Now, the equilibrium condition states that the slope of the curve equals the ratio of vertical to horizontal forces. Mathematically, dy over dx equals w over t sub zero, which equals w times s over t sub zero. Now, Johann applied the power of calculus. Step one, simplify constants. Define a constant a equals t sub zero over w. This represents the parameter of the curve. Our equation becomes dy over dx equals s over a. Step two, form the differential equation. Differentiate with respect to x. d squared y over dx squared equals one over a times ds over dx. Step three, substitute the arc length formula. We know that ds over dx equals the square root of 1 plus the quantity dy over dx squared. Substituting, d squared y over dx squared equals 1 over a times the square root of 1 plus the quantity dy over dx all squared. Step 4. Integration. For the first integration, let p equal dy over dx. Then, dp over dx equals 1 over a times the square root of 1 plus p squared. Separating variables, dp over the square root of 1 plus p squared equals dx over a. Integrating both sides, inverse hyperbolic sine of p equals x over a plus c, with the boundary condition at x equals 0, p equals 0, meaning at the lowest point the slope is 0, we get c equals 0. Therefore, p equals hyperbolic sine of x over a. So our first integration yields the slope, dy over dx equals hyperbolic sine of x over a. For the second integration, we integrate again, y equals a times hyperbolic cosine of x over a plus c. With the boundary condition at x equals 0, y equals a, we get y equals a times hyperbolic cosine of x over a. This is the final form. The significance. This proved the curve was a transcendental hyperbolic cosine, not a parabola, not a simple algebraic curve. This was a major early triumph for calculus. But Johann's triumph came with a cost. 
Instead of celebrating with his brother and mentor, Johann publicly mocked Jacob's struggles with the catenary problem. This ignited a lifelong rivalry with the very brother who had taught him mathematics in the first place. But the betrayals were just beginning. In 1691, Johann made a deal with the Marquis de L'Hôpital. Johann would provide mathematical discoveries to the Marquis in exchange for an annual salary of 300 livres. The condition? L'Hôpital could publish them under his own name. This led to the publication of what we now call L'Hôpital's Rule in 1696, a fundamental technique in calculus that Johann had actually discovered. Author disputes would last for centuries. But perhaps the most shocking betrayal was yet to come. When Johann and his son Daniel shared a prize from the Paris Academy in 1734, Johann was so furious at sharing the glory that he banned Daniel from his house, his own son, exiled, for being too successful. And then came the plagiarism. Johann later backdated his own book, Hydraulica, to 1732 to plagiarize Daniel's masterpiece, Hydrodynamica, and claim priority for discoveries that were rightfully his son's. Glory, it seemed, was indeed never shared in Johann Bernoulli's world. But perhaps Johann's most elegant achievement was solving the bracca stokron problem, finding the path a particle takes to slide from point A to point B in the shortest possible time under gravity. Is it a straight line? No, the fastest path curves downward initially to gain speed faster. Johann used a brilliant analogy with light refraction, applying Snell's law to a falling particle. Step 1. Trigonometry. The angle theta that the tangent makes with the vertical is given by sine of theta equals dx over ds. Step 2. Physics. Using Snell's law, sine of theta over v equals c, and substituting velocity from gravity, v equals the square root of 2gy, dx over ds times the square root of 2gy equals c. This simplifies to dx over ds times the square root of y equals k, where k is a constant. Step 3. Squaring and substitution. Square both sides. dx squared over ds squared times y equals k squared. Therefore, dx squared equals k squared times y times ds squared. Since ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared, we substitute dx squared equals k squared times y times the quantity dx squared plus dy squared. Step 4. Final equation. Rearranging. dx squared equals k squared y times dx squared plus k squared y times dy squared. dx squared times the quantity 1 minus k squared y equals k squared y times dy squared. Therefore, dx squared equals k squared y over the quantity 1 minus k squared y all times dy squared. Taking the square root, dx equals the square root of k squared y over the quantity 1 minus k squared y, all times dy. Johann recognized this as the differential equation for an inverted cycloid, the curve traced by a point on a rolling wheel. The fastest path isn't the straightest, it's the one that follows the geometry of a rolling wheel. Beautiful. Elegant. Perfect. Johann Bernoulli died in 1748 at age 81, outliving his brother, his rivals, and even some of his own children. Despite his flaws, his jealousy, his betrayals, his ruthless need for exclusive glory, his contributions to mathematics were undeniable. He was one of history's greatest teachers, mentoring Leonhard Euler, who would go on to become perhaps the most prolific mathematician who ever lived. He standardized much of the notation for calculus that we still use today, and he transformed calculus from an abstract curiosity into a universal tool for solving physical problems, from hanging chains to sliding particles to the motion of planets. Johann Bernoulli proved that knowledge could indeed be taught, but glory, in his mind, glory was never shared. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.